Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. This is the third year uh, in a row that I've given these lectures and uh, I always enjoy it very much. I don't uh, have the opportunity to lecture to uh, uh, undergraduates uh, where I am and so this is my one chance the year to have exposure to people at, at, uh, at your level and it's, uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, so what, what I'm going to talk about today um, is, well you can see the, the title here, and uh, this, is a, this is a research talk. And um, so there are things in here that you are, you know, will be familiar to you. We'll be talking about the biological carbon pump, which I, I think uh, Rachel said you talked about earlier in the quarter. So there'll be things like that that are, are familiar to you, and then there'll be other things that I'm sure uh, that you've never seen before and uh, will be unknown to you. And then there'll be other things that are brand new, things that are my group's research. And so um, you have a, a kind of a, a, a continuum here from the established to the published, but maybe not familiar to you, to cutting edge or brand new uh, results. And so um, I think it's a good thing to give this kind of talk. It's this, you know, it's not uh, dumbed down is what we would say in the U.S. It's not, I, it's, it's what I would give if I were going to another uh, uh, oceanographic de department somewhere. Um, so uh, anyway, I think uh, it's uh, again it's a good good to give this kind of talk because as you become more of a scientist, you have to become uh, more and more comfortable with not knowing things. Uh, and so I feel like the more and more I do this, uh, the less and less I know. Uh, and that's just a natural progression uh, toward becoming a scientist, where you're immersed in the unknown and sometimes the uh, uh, unknowable and so hopefully this will be a good exposure uh, uh, for you to that aspect of scientific research. So um, so th these are two pictures I'd like to start out with here. This is an oceanographic uh, research vessel and so that's the ocean and that's maybe not what you think of. Maybe you think of something, you know, a, a shore from the beach or something along those lines. Uh, sunsets. Um, and this is a photomicrograph of all the things that live in seawater. And so when I look at the sea, uh, this is more what I see. And uh, so I'm just going to kind of start out with some kind of gee whiz facts you guys may already know or may not. So in a gallon of, uh, of seawater, there are about as many microbes as there are people on Earth. And we don't know what those microbes do. I mean, we know what some of them do, but a lot of them we don't know uh, what they do. And so that's a real uh, open question. And as a chemist, we use chemistry to, to tackle these because looking at this picture here, I don't know if you can see it very well, but there are just little dots. You're looking under a microscope. You can't tell one microbe from another most of the time. So we use chemicals to figure out who they are and what they're doing. And that's a real problem uh, because there is a fantastic amount of diversity uh, in the ocean. And I'll touch on this here uh, in a little bit. So just uh, as an example, if you took all the DNA from all these little critters that lived in the ocean, throughout the whole ocean, and made it into a single strand, how long do you guys think it would be? Anybody have a guess? Come on, guys. From here to where? Here to Jupiter. Here to Chicago, anybody? Okay. Well, when you do the calculation, that strand of information, the little you know, bits of DNA, it's about 15 billion light years in length. Okay, so that strand comes, extends from here to the beginning of the universe, uh, which just blows my mind. Okay, so you can think about that, in, that, that you know, one tiny little atom at a time, all the information that is encoded by that DNA, and it becomes a little bit overwhelming. But you'll see there are some things that uh, all this uh, molecular diversity come together and run processes that are very important. And so without much more introduction, I'll review with you the biological uh, uh, carbon pump. So just to, to step through the carbon pump, the, uh, the first step here is the equilibration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere with carbon dioxide uh, in the surface waters. And then carbon dioxide is taken up by um, by the uh, plankton, phytoplankton that live in the ocean, and they turn it into uh, particulate organic carbon. And this is a really wondrous transformation to me because what you're doing is you're taking something that's dissolved 
and then turning it into something that's solid. And when it's solid, that means it can be uh, uh, influenced by gravity. Okay, so you're transferring something from dissolved to something that can be influenced by gravity. And what that does is it leads to the sinking of this POC down into the deep ocean. But all along the way, there are little bacteria and other organisms that are interacting with this uh, organic matter and respiring it. And so taking that POC, oops, and turning it back into CO2. So through this process, you've taken CO2 from the atmosphere down in uh, to the ocean. Now, the, uh, the biological carbon pump is not very efficient, so this is only about 10% or so of the carbon that turns into particular organic carbon or the biomass of phytoplankton uh, actually makes it down deep here uh, in, into the sea. But even though it's inefficient, it's actually really important because it's really the only reservoir in the ocean where carbon can be stored on the time scale of, of decades and centuries uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a meaningful manner from a quantitative perspective. And uh, maybe you heard about this, but just to, to remind you that through this process here, both of CO2 solubility in the ocean and uh, this export of particular organic carbon, about a third of all the CO2 that's been uh, generated from fossil fuel burning uh, is actually in the ocean right now. Uh, so we can thank the ocean through this process for keeping the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere much lower than they would be uh, otherwise. So this is a very important problem uh, and we don't know, I mean this is the basics of it, but there's so many intricacies along the way that involve all different kinds of microbes and all different kinds of chemicals that they make that it, it, it's still a very open and wonderful question to study. And I guess I would argue that this is a, because of this, it's a really great time to get into the ocean sciences. Um, this, uh, the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere is arguably one of the uh, uh, defining scientific problems of, of our age. And so by going into to the, to the earth and environmental sciences, you guys will have a, potentially have the opportunity to uh, contribute to, to how this problem uh, unfolds over the next few decades and centuries. So there are challenges to, to, to studying the biological pump. And I kind of have these, these D words here. So the first one here is there are millions of different microbial species. So in that, in that gallon of seawater that I was talking about with five billion organisms, you might have tens of thousands of different strains of organisms in there. Oops, sorry about that. Don't know. Okay. Um, the other thing uh, is that it's really dynamic. So all that uh, particular organic carbon uh, in the ocean, it turns over on the time scale of weeks, which is kind of really uh, interesting to, to think about. That uh, you know by um, you know by the end of the by the end of November, all of that carbon and all the throughout all the oceans on average will be gone. It will be cycled, either leaking through the biological pump or respired, turning over very quickly. So that carbon reservoir is very different from the one in, on land. So trees and biomass on, the, on land has a much longer residence time, whereas the stuff in the ocean is much shorter. So it's very dynamic. What's, uh, what you study on a cruise on a Monday um, is going to be gone by the following Monday. And so that just underscores how important it is to run a, a well-executed field campaign. Um, secondly, the, the, the molecules and the microbes in the ocean are dilute. So even though there's you know, billions in a gallon of seawater, in terms of the volume that they occupy, it's, only, it's a billionth of a fraction of, of that volume. So that's why seawater is mostly clear. It doesn't look cloudy because there's microbes in it because they're actually really, really small fraction of the volume that is there. And also, uh, it, studying um, microbes in the ocean can be difficult at times, and I just include uh, this video here. I don't know if you guys uh, probably haven't been to sea yet, but sometimes uh, when you're out there, uh, it looks like this. And that's really difficult for me because I get, in I get incredibly seasick. So when we go out, I mean, invariably, I'm either the first or second person that gets sick on every cruise. And so it's kind of embarrassing because I spent almost a year of my life at sea at this stage, and yet I'm still incredibly uh, uh, susceptible to this, to, this, uh, to this malady. So these are the challenges in studying the biological pump. So let's walk through the biological pump in, in step here, and I'll begin to introduce um, the, the, the topic of this talk, which is uh, microbial communication. So we're gonna kind of head that way now 
building upon the skeleton of the biological uh, pump. So you have photosynthesis here, we talked about before, CO2 is being taken up by phytoplankton. Um, and it's uh, basically, the, it's the sole, they're the sole agents of photosynthesis in the op open ocean. These phytoplankton, they can be cyanobacteria and they can be uh, eukaryotes. But um, nature abhors a particle or abhors B uh, POC uh, in the ocean. Like I said, it has a very short residence time. And part of the reason for this um, is because it is because uh, zooplankton and other organisms respire this and run it the other direction. And they also play a uh, defining role in the biological pump. And so here you have uh, zooplankton uh, interacting with the, with the phytoplankton. They eat it and they defecate, they respire. And so and they also, um, the, the phytoplankton themselves can die. And so it's through these processes that most of that phytoplankton is turned to CO2 and a small fraction of it is, is then assembled into these particles which are big enough to sink through, through the ocean. Now I've kind of made it look like the zooplankton go out there and mow down the whole thing and there's no, no, phy no phytoplankton there anymore. That's not how it works. It's constantly being turned over. But this cartoon is just to underscore uh, the process. So zooplankton play an important role by making these, these, uh, these aggregates. And these aggregates are what we call microbial hotspots. And I'll show you some pictures in a few minutes. In these um, aggregates are bits and pieces of phytoplankton. Some of them are still alive. Um, and there's also um, bacteria that are associated with this uh, through uh, when they go through the zooplankton uh, digestive tract. Um, and so these are really um, hotbeds for microbial interactions because the microbes are so close to each other as opposed to in that gallon of seawater where they're very far apart. They're very tightly packed and this is an environment uh, akin to what we call a biofilm and in biofilms microbes often wind up talking to each other. They have to talk to each other using chemical signals in order to make a living as a group. Okay so back to the biological carbon pump here. Um, this is a very famous figure from a paper that was written by uh, John Martin et al. in the late 80s. And um, basically what this is a plot of is this is the plot of the flux of that sinking organic matter. So this is not, this is not the concentration of how much is in there. This is like if you put out uh, uh, a ring in the water column that's a meter, uh, uh, the area is a meter long and you are looking how the particles pass through that. So it's a flux, it's a flow of carbons in the units of mole carbon per meter squared per year. And that flux gets less and less and less as you go deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's because when the particles are sinking down, there are bacteria that I said closely packed to it and they respire the organic matter and turn it back into CO2 like I showed you at the very beginning. So it gets less and less as you go further down. And it's described uh, with this, uh, this equation here. Uh, and this is, this is a this equation is that curve there, which is the, the Martin curve. And so a very famous equation, and there's this B value, which describes the shape of this curve. And so we'll go back to what this B value means here uh, coming up. And then I put this up here. This is a plot of the, um, of the carbon-14 <coughs> age of seawater. And what this tells you basically is a, it's a clock that, that describes how long it's been since that seawater has been in contact uh, with the atmosphere. And so probably not surprising, the deeper the water is, the older that, that water is. That means it's the longer it's been since it's been in contact with the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And so this is what carbon sequestration is really about. You have this flux of carbon, it rains down into uh, the ocean in waters that are probably not likely to come to the surface again for quite a long time. And so that's the essence of it. And um, this B value that describes the shape of the curve uh, is very, uh, very important because a high value means that, a lot, that not much gets down and a low value means uh, that a lot of it uh, gets down. And um, so if this were zero, this would be a straight line showing that everything that starts sinking gets all the way um, to the bottom. And there's a re recent modeling study that came out 
where they uh, related that exponent, that B value, to the concentration of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere. Because you're taking that, when those sinking particles sink, you're transporting carbon from the surface ocean in equilibrium with the atmosphere into the depth. So, so the shape of that curve really matters. You can see uh, these are different model, you know, computational models. So don't, don't worry about which, which is blue and which is red and, and which is dashed and which is solid. The point here is that as B goes up, then that uh, would equate to greater levels of CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. So if, uh, you know, if carbon dioxide levels were right around here before the Industrial Revolution, but now they're up here, if you kind of look at that curve, that is kind of the difference between going from 0.8 to, to 1.4 on that B value uh, curve. And, um, and you can also think of this B value can mathematically be related to the mean depth at which those particles are respired back into the carbon dioxide. So, so what's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that this B value varies all over the ocean, and we don't know why it varies. So this is a, a review that came out a few years ago, and all these different colors are from different locations in the ocean where they fit these curves to it over and over and over again. And you can see the range of the Martin B is what they call it, this coefficient can go from about 1.3 to about 0.3. So there's a huge range. And remember that previous slide, that huge range, you know, a range of 0.3, which is off the scale to 1.3, is essentially the entire range of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere. So, so that's a little disconcerting that we don't understand what impacts this range. And that's where my research starts to come in as I've been working on this problem for a long time trying to figure out why B varies like it does uh, uh, across the ocean. And my view of this whole problem is a particle-centric view. So I think of this as something that happens on a particle-by-particle -particle basis. And the first thing that happens is colonization. So a particle is made, and it may have some bacteria that are in it already, but once it's produced and it starts on its way down, bacteria are drawn to it because it's food. It's this organic matter that they respire back into carbon dioxide. So bacteria can actually swim toward this particle and, uh, and con uh, um, colonize it. And um, most of these bacteria, as I said, are heterotrophic. They see this as food and are uh, respiring. So this is kind of a cartoon view of that attraction of, uh, of these cells, these bacterial cells, to these particles. Um, but if you look at our microscope, it uh, looks a little bit different. So this is an actual particle. And what I've done is I've stained it. Actually, my colleague did this, uh, this work. Uh, what he did is he stained it so that we could see all the individual cells. So all these little blue dots here are individual bacterial cells that are, have been attracted to this particle and are respiring it. And all these other bits and pieces here, see this kind of honeycomb looking shape here? That's a hunk of a diatom. Uh, a type of phytoplankton that makes its its body out of out of glass essentially. So this is a really complex um, uh, environment here, and the the what's what's equally complex are the bits and pieces there, but also the community of microbes that live uh, in this uh, uh, in in this environment. So if you look at these are all different types of bacteria here, and these are some different particles. These are actually particles associated with a, a cyanobacterium um, in the ocean. And you can see the pie chart uh, shows that there's a lot of different families of microbes. And the, the critical thing is to see how different these are from this one here. These are the different groups that are in the free-living uh, bacteria. And so when this thing sinks, it's not like... Uh, you know, it's not sticky. Well, it is sticky, but it's not like it's just, uh, you know, impacting the microbes on the way down and just, it's not like fly paper where, the, where things just stick to it. Um, because if it were, then you would expect these two things to be very similar to each other because when it sinks, it's essentially straining all the microbes uh, out of the organic matter. But instead, it's different, and that's telling us that it's a highly specialized community. And so much like on, on land where you have a four rainforest or something like that where you have all different organisms living very closely to each other, communication or interaction between those organisms is absolutely key to all of them making, uh, making a living. And so that's kind of the next step on this diagram here is 
uh, uh, microbial um, um, communication. And so one of the one um, type of um, of communication mechanism we study is called quorum sensing. And so quorum sensing um, is a, a very uh, popular um, area of, of uh, scientific research. And it's basically a way that microbes communicate with each other using these molecules here called acylated homocerine lactones. So they can't talk, they can't vibrate or make any other kind of communication. They do it by secreting communication molecules. And these are the ones uh, that I'm really uh, interested in here. And so the next couple slides, I'm going to introduce quorum sensing. I'm going to introduce it uh, in, in th I'm going to introduce it in three ways because it's really important that you get it and it's, a, it's an important process that has um, uh, applications in your daily life. And so what quorum sensing is, is it says that, um, so if you have, let's say this is a brand new, newly minted sinking particle in the surface ocean and this is time. And as microbes colonize the sinking particle and begin to grow, the density of those microbes gets higher and higher. And so what quorum sensing is, is it's behaviors that microbes engage in that they don't do unless there's a sufficient number of other organisms kind of on their side. And so um, here you can see they don't, whatever behavior this is, whatever activity this is, they don't do it until they reach this density and then this is called the critical density or the quorum. And so when they hit this critical density, then they all together change. They change their behavior and they do something in concert. Okay, now I'm gonna give you an example that I'm afraid most of you have experience with. Okay, and this is an example, um, well actually maybe, hopefully not all of you do, but I know you know somebody who's had this experience. It's the experience of eating a raw oyster. Okay, so you eat a raw oyster out at dinner, maybe it's an appetizer, you're with friends, so everything's good, raw oysters, everybody has a round, you have a couple pints, things are good. You know, you go home, you go to bed, feeling on top of the world, but then at like two o'clock in the morning, you wake up violently ill, okay? And because what's happened is in that oyster, there were some Vibrio parahemolyticus or some other organism that results in food poisoning. Okay, and if you've ever felt this, it hits you like a freight train. It happens instantly. You feel good one minute, and then 15 minutes later, you think you're gonna die. And that's because those microbes use quorum sensing. So you eat that infected oyster, and those microbes are in your gut, and they begin to grow. But what they don't wanna do is look virulent, or look, look nasty, because your body will start to mount in a response to, to, to neutralize this microbial threat in your gut. And instead, what they do is they wait until there's enough of them until they've hit this critical quorum, and then whammo. They all at once change their behavior, and they turn on that virulent behavior. And so that's why you feel fine one minute, and then you feel like you're gonna die about a half hour later. Okay, so this is quorum sensing. And um, quorum sensing is mediated by uh, cell signaling molecules. So when bugs are hanging out, they secrete these molecules. And so the idea here is the more and more bugs grow, the more and more molecules are out there and microbes begin to sense um, that there are enough of their neighbors there to engage in this orchestrated, coordinated microbial behavior. Quorum sensing. So let's do one more illustration on this here. If you didn't like the shellfish poisoning uh, example, we'll do one here. It's a little bit um, less um, off-putting. Um, so here you have a lone bacterium here in this, this, this lecture hall here or a state room or something like that represents a sinking particle. So there's one microbe there and the microbe wants to do something but it only does it collectively, and so there's nobody there. And so it starts to send out these signals into the room to see if there's other microbes there, and it doesn't look like there is. And so, but as the population increases, there are more and more bacteria in this environment, more bacteria, there's more and more of these singling molecules starting to build up in the environment. And then when there's enough of these sing uh, signaling molecules, then 
this coordinated behavior begins. And so the way it works is there's, this is the DNA of the microbe here, and this is a, a transcriptional activator, it's a receptor. And when there's enough of this acylate homocerine lactone stuff in the en environment, it binds to that to transcriptional activator, and that sits down on the DNA, and then it begins to, disc to, to make the genes for the, 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 the orchestrated behavior. And so in the, in the shellfish poisoning example, some of those genes are the ones that encode the things that make you sick. But if you're a microbe in the environment, maybe there are other things that you want to do together, especially when you're tightly packed uh, in a sinking particle. Now, um, quorum sensing um, has a huge, there's a lot of interest in, uh, in human health because the quorum sensing is involved in so many diseases. Um, it's involved in the, the infections that uh, impacts uh, patients with cystic fibrosis. It impacts uh, wound healing. Uh, there's a lot of different diseases where quorum sensing uh, is at play. But it's actually a marine uh, discovery. So quorum sensing was first discovered in the ocean. And it was discovered um, in these microbes that live in this squid here called Vibrio fisheri. So if maybe you guys have, uh, will have a chance, if you haven't already, to take a general microbiology laboratory class while you're uh, in here, depending on what discipline you're in. And if you do, you might run this experiment where you isolate these microbes that actually glow in the dark. They bioluminesce. But they only bioluminesce when they're all together because if you're one tiny microbe glowing, nobody can see you. You're way too small. You don't make enough light for any other organism to see that you're there. You only grow when there's a whole bunch of you together, like in this colonies or like in this really dense culture here. So what happens is these Hawaiian bobtail squid is what they're called. They hang out in, in, the, in the waters off Hawaii. And every morning they go and they eat a little bit of sand. And in that sand contains some Vibrio fisheri. And through the day, the squid feeds those microbes food, and the microbes grow. And then around sundown, every night, those microbes have grown to a sufficient density that they are now in a chorate population. They've reached that critical density, and they all glow. <coughs> and so the, this, the squid actually glows on its underbelly. It glows in the dark. And so the reason it does that is a form of camouflage, because in the night sky, if there's a moon up there or something like that, you cast a shadow. You look like a dark splotch compared to the light coming from the stars in the, in the moon. And so you're a target for predators. So what they've done is they've adapted this system so that they cast their own moonlight from their bellies with the help of these organisms as a, as a form of camouflage. Um, we've also found that um, quorum sensing can ha happen on very um, big scales. So this is a map, you've probably seen these maps before, showing what the Earth looks like with all the light pollution from urban centers and things along those lines. Well, it turns out occasionally things like this are picked up, a glowing region of the ocean. Uh, and this has been enhanced, this is an enhanced image, but these glowing sections of the ocean are huge patches you, you can see here, uh, you know, here's Saudi Arabia in the Horn of Africa, how huge these patches of the ocean are where microbes have grown dense enough that they reach a quarry uh, population and they begin to, to grow and glow. Um, so a little bit about these molecules here. These are molecules this, uh, that, that we study in my lab. We, uh, we measure them. They are the currency of this uh, uh, quorum sensing communication system. There's all different kinds of them. Some of them have different lengths of tails. Some of them actually have a group out here that looks a lot like the flavor of cumin. Um, so there's all kinds of interesting molecules here. Very, and they're very, um, they tend to be unstable. So they make a signal, these things only last for a couple hours. You have to think about that, that makes sense. If you're a, uh, a microbe that's gonna, only gonna live for a day or two, you want to, to, to secrete a language that lives for shorter than that amount of time. You know, you don't want to be like in the morning sending out some signal and then by the afternoon everything has changed. Uh, you don't want to be kind of slave to what you said earlier in the day. You want to be able to chemically change your mind. And so that's what, uh, why these are short-lived. They're short-lived on purpose. Um, but these molecules are way less um, 
than a trillionth of the carbon in a sinking particle. So when we try to analyze these things, we have these little sinking particles, and then we're going to analyze molecules that are one trillionth of the carbon that's in there. So that's the analytical challenge, and that's where, as an analytical chemist, it gets to be really fun. Um, but there are ways to, to kind of cheat this. And one of them, so we have things that are very scarce in really, really small particles. So one way to get more signal is to collect lots of particles. And so we use this thing here called a sediment net trap. So this thing is basically a big funnel that we put out in the ocean. We let it sink down to a certain depth and it sits there for a day or so, maybe a few hours, maybe a couple days. And all the organic particles that rain down are trapped and they get concentrated in the bottom of this funnel. And so we have some of these things that are almost two meters in diameter. So really big. This one's about a meter and a quarter in diameter. And then we get all these particles and then we analyze them using various types of mass spectrometry. So I'm just going to show a couple of videos from, from the sea to show you what these things look like. So here we are. We have this thing and we're preparing it. That's uh, Justin, one of the guys that works uh, in my lab. So we get these things uh, ready to go over the side. And uh, then we put them over the side so we're at sea. And I stuck a GoPro on the end of a, of a broomstick and I made this video of it uh, going down deep uh, into the ocean. And then we have these, um, these uh, floats that we attach to them here. I'll uh, replay this video if I can. Um, so they're, they're basically dangling on a rope uh, from these floats that are in the ocean. And so we let these things drift out. We let it sit there for about a day drifting on the currents. It's not attached to the bottom. It's just floating. And it's always uh, amazing when you put these things out there how small everything gets. They're really hard uh, to spot. So a lot of times, not, not very often, about one in a hundred times, we put one of these things out and we never see it again. It's just gone. And we don't know what happens. Although one time, we think we knew what happened. And that was because, oops, sorry, there you go for the third time. Um, one of ours was actually attacked by a pod of whales. Okay, so these are these uh, pilot whales here and that's our, 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 our um, sediment trap array out there. We were able actually to, to get that one back uh, after scaring off uh, off the whales, and uh, when we get all when we're done with this whole thing, we're dragging all the gear back on board, and uh, you know it takes it takes an hour or so to get everything back, and we bring it on deck, and here's the bottom of the trap. This is called the cod end, and this is what we get. Now, it's not a bad video, okay? You probably can't see anything there, okay? Because what happens is even though we have a funnel that's this big around, the flux of that organic matter is actually really small. So you may only get, even in something this big, um, maybe the amount of, uh, of uh, particles, maybe in one of these mints, about that much, might be spread out all in these different forms in the bottom of the trap. And so the reason the biological pump is, not so, is so strong and moves so much carbon it isn't, you know, it isn't like it's just raining junk from the surface to the deep. It's because of the area of the ocean. So we have, to, we have to cover, if we want to get some of this material, we have to put out this huge trap. And then even when we do, we only get a little bit of stuff uh, to play around with. So we've done this uh, all over the ocean. We go out and we collect this stuff. And what we're going to do is analyze it and see if we can find these signaling molecules. So we have locations here off Hawaii, off of the Pacific Northwest of the United States, here off Bermuda and down here uh, heading on toward the uh, uh, western uh, equatorial or western tropical North Atlantic. And so um, these are um, uh, chromatograms. So I'm not sure if, has is, is everyone here had some exposure to chromatography maybe in high school or, or I'm sorry, whatever you call the place you were before you came to college. Uh, <laughs> Uh, sorry, you know, where you separate uh, organic molecules. And that's what this is, is it's a plot with time, and this, uh, this is intensity here on this axis. So when you've got this mass spectrometer, which is a really fancy way of, it basically can see molecules based on how much their, their, their uh, uh, atomic weight is. 
And so the thing is sitting there and looking for a molecule to come out with the same atomic weight as this. In this case, it's 228. And we're, we then fragment it into a bit that's uh, 102 mass units in size. And um, so we wait, and this thing is going through this instrument, and it's coming out, and finally, our peak of interest comes out. And so this is the peak in a pure standard of that molecule, and this is an extract uh, from our trap. And so this is how we're able to confirm that we get the molecules that we're looking for from, the, from those samples that we collected. Um, also, you can take um, sinking particles and then isolate the bacteria that live in those sinking particles. And when we did that, we found that a lot of those, those guys are, interestingly, some of them are Vibrio, so the same genus of microbe that give you shellfish poisoning if you eat a bad oyster. Um, very closely related there. Um, we see that they make all these different kinds of molecules here, various different chain lengths. Some of them have an oxygen on the third carbon in. So this was a really big deal because what our research showed was that the, when these sinking particles are coming down, the microbes that live on those sinking particles are actually talking to each other. And so why was that important? <coughs> What's the big deal? And so this is the big deal is those microbes, as I said at the beginning of the talk, when they're sinking, they're respiring that organic matter. In order to respire it, they have to break it apart and begin to hydrolyze it. So they begin to digest it, basically. And so the idea here is that microbes use quorum sensing to decide when it's a good idea to turn on these hydrolytic uh, enzymes. And uh, as it turns out, um, this is a review that came out a, year, uh, a few years ago now that lists, you can't really read this, it lists all different types of organisms that have been studied where quorum sensing has been investigated. And then these are the different behaviors <coughs> that were regulated by quorum sensing. And all these little highlighted areas are places where digestive enzymes on the outside of the cell were regulated by quorum sensing. So it's very common for microbes to use these digestive enzymes to um, break apart organic matter. And you can see what that is here. This is a piece of, this is called marine snow, which is a bunch of particles stuck together. And when you add those enzymes, it takes it from these big particles and starts to digest it into little tiny particles, which are then respired by the microbes. And so there's a theoretical basis for this. And the idea is that if you're a microbe living near in a sinking particle and there's organic matter, if you start to digest the stuff around you, there's a risk. And the risk associated with that is that you digest the stuff, but it just diffuses away. So you don't get it back. Instead, it feeds uh, some other microbe that's next door to you. Because when, those di when the, the microbe starts to digest things, it's not, you know, it doesn't, it's not like us where it has a fork and a spoon and actually takes the food and puts it in its mouth. It digests it on the outside of the cell and it really has no way of getting that food back into the cell other than molecular d d diffusion. And so when you have that kind of process, that those, um, here's the concentration, this is the distance from the cell, here's the concentration of the hydrolytic enzyme near the cell, and here's the product. But a lot of that product diffuses away. And so that's a real downer if you're a microbe because you've made all these really ex energetically expensive enzymes and yet the stuff that they, they digest just uh, drifts away. So the idea here is to use quorum sensing so that everybody does it at once. So if your neighbor is doing it here, you can be here and you can benefit from it. And so that's what we did is we took sinking particles, we collected them, and we did these experiments where we can measure the activity of uh, digestive enzymes. And so that's what this plot is here. These are different types of, of uh, digestive enzymes. One of them is a phosphatase, which attacks things like DNA. And, and uh, here is an aminopeptidase, which attacks proteins. And here is a, uh, an enzyme, a digestive enzyme that digests um, lipids or fat molecules. And so what we see here, and in this plot here is one type of quorum sensing molecule, and this is a different mixture of quorum sensing molecules. And so depending on where you are, you see a response. And it was actually, it's actually a little disappointing for us from a scientific per perspective because so many different things can happen. So if you look here um, in, um, 
in the, so this is this area here off the Pacific Northwest. If you add one type of signaling molecule, you don't get any response for, we don't, they don't turn on their protein digestion systems unless you give them this particular signal. So there's a lot of complexity here. Different locations, different activities, and um, it's, uh, it was a very mixed and, and slightly confusing signal, but what was neat about the signal was how big it was when, when we saw it places. And so remember that B value here, we can equate this response to that B value, and you can see Depending on all these different responses, we can basically account for the entire global range of B with quorum sensing. Um, so this is an interesting slide here. This is just at one location, and we're using different concentrations from low to high. And it's, it's neat because in some places here, uh, so you see less and less response as you use more and more signaling molecule and this is that phosphatase enzyme that degrades DNA. And so that's really interesting. And basically it's not just um, the type of molecule, but it's how loud they communicate with each other. And it looks like some, uh, some sweet nothing whispers are a little bit more effective in this case than shouting at the top of, uh, of, of your lungs. And so that's what this, these data here are, are showing that different concentrations of these molecules which are akin to the volume uh, change. And so here we are, this is kind of the, the end of the line of the process. So we've walked through this whole step from the phytoplankton to the, uh, to the um, settling of the, those, these, these sinking particles, to the quorum sensing, and now to this coordinated destruction or degradation of these, of these sinking particles. And so it's kind of the end of the line here where big particles are being turned uh, into small particles and in the process you're making a bunch of carbon dioxide. And so just to wrap, it, wrap this up, the way we're thinking about quorum sensing and the biological pump is that you may have locations where there's no quorum sensing and so you have a little deeper attenuation here, but you might have other places where you have quorum sensing and the microbes are using that to accelerate the uh, uh, digestion and degradation of that organic matter. And that's important because when things are uh, degraded and turned back into CO2 at shallower depths, they're closer to the surface waters and they're more likely to get mixed back uh, into the surface ocean. And so I'll leave, uh, I'll leave you with that thought and I thank you for your attention and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. carbon pump in the first instance, which you're familiar with from your lectures last week, right up to cutting edge science and where research in this area is going. Uh, so does anybody have any questions they would like to ask Ben? Yes. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, you mentioned a great variety of uh, chrono molecules, but does that equal with the and variety of the microorganism community as well? That's or a, is it just the molecules, basically? Yeah, that's a really, really, really great question. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, it's a fantastic question because um, there are a lot of diversity to those molecules, um, but there's even greater microbial diversity. And so it's kind of, if you use the idea that, there are, are li that these are languages, um, these acylate homocerine lactones, the molecules I'm studying, they might be, you can kind of think of those as like the romance languages. So there's other signaling molecules that are made of peptides and other types of molecules, but these AHLs are all the romance languages. And so within that you have Italian and you have Spanish um, and different microbes speak those languages, but there's also the local dialects that uh, are, are even more specific. And, um, and so there are microbes that um, can speak all varieties of languages. So they, are, they, they can hear the Italian and s communicate in Italian. They can communicate in Spanish. Um, but um, but there's some that only know a very narrow dialect. Uh, so it's a great question. And we don't know the answer to it in the ocean, but we know in a clinical setting, 
So there are some microbes that cause really bad infections. Like I mentioned the one that cystic fibrosis patients get, it affects their lungs. And they use a very specific quorum sensing molecule to regulate their virulence, their disease factors. Um, it turns out that there are chemists that have come up with an antibiotic that looks a lot like a quorum sensing molecule, but it's not exactly a quorum sensing molecule. And so what happens is patients are, are this is still in uh, clinical trials, but patients are taking these molecules in into the lungs and then the molecules bind to those transport, those, those transcriptional activators inside the cell and they bind it incorrectly. And so the, the organism are not allowed, to they're not able to turn on their quorum sensing behavior. So a lot of languages, a lot of bugs, but interestingly, it's a line of important uh, current research in the health sciences basically using medicines to insinuate yourselves, insinuate um, doctors and clinicians into these conversations that are happening between microbes. So that was a good question. Oh. Are you planning on new, what kind of applications are you expecting to use this information for? Like, are you going to control the population of microbes? Yeah, that's that, that's a that's a that's a very good question, and, and that's I think a reasonable question to ask, especially um, in our current uh, kind of scientific climate. There's a real a desire to know what the practical applications are of of our scientific research. So it's a very uh, a good question, and um, I think that this is probably not something that humans can interfere with in an in a ocean scale. And it's mainly because these molecules are very short-lived. So even if you were to chuck some over the side of the boat into the ocean, they would, be, they would degrade very rapidly. Or if you made some of these synthetic molecules, they would be very expensive to make. Um, but I think, yes, you could think about them being a chemical way that humans could uh, manipulate the biological carbon pump uh, if that was something that uh, uh, humanity decided that it really needed to be able to do uh, in the future. Um, but as it stands, um, I don't think we have the technology to do that, and then there's all these ethical considerations <coughs> about whether we should uh, or should not do that. Um, but uh, I think um, um, what we're learning about these molecules, though, um, is having applications for, there are some diseases that you can get um, in the ocean, so there are, if you have, uh, this happens every so often in the United States, it's really terrible. A small child will go to the beach with a cut on their leg from playing around or something like that, and it gets infected by these horrible bacteria that can lead to the loss of the limb, and, um, or even death in some cases. And those microbes definitely use quorum sensing uh, in the course of that infection. And so these, these molecules in trial are also being considered as uh, antibiotics for those types of situations. So our work by knowing about these molecules in the ocean is on the perimeter influencing how that, the, the, that uh, those infections are being fought. Okay, I had a question. It yeah. was along a similar vein, really, uh -huh. um, in that you know, if, if you could turn off the quorum sensing that um, uh, 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 releases these um, digestive enzymes, yeah. uh, then that would stop the particular organic carbon being broken down. Right. So hence it would go down into the deep ocean. Yeah, it's this scenario here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's a way of taking more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Yeah. My question was going to be, you know, can you manipulate them so that they can't do this? and then we could use that as a way of um, increasing carbon uptake into the oceans and hence out of the atmosphere. Yeah, no, and, and I think that's, that was kind of what I was, very similar to the yeah. earlier question. And um, so I don't think, uh, yeah, I, I think it's probably, at least today, not a viable geoengineering solution. Mm -hmm. um, but you never know. I mean. You know, uh, this problem of CO2 in the atmosphere is getting worse and it's going to stay with us for a long time. I don't remember exactly what happens, but if we stop burning fossil fuel today, it would be centuries before the carbon dioxide levels got back down to where they were before the industrial uh, re revolution. So, um, so it may be a time in the future where we have to start thinking about this and this could be attacked 
um, to do it. But right now, we're just trying to understand why those B values, why the attenuation is different in some parts of the ocean and not in, in the others. And so that was why we looked at it in so many different locations, to us to be able to see if there was some geographical pat pattern. And it, it, even though it didn't seem like there was, it's still something that we're working on. No more questions. We'll just um, thank Ben again. Thank you.